Welcome back. Hopefully everyone had a uh, good lunch. Hopefully those who are watching us live on the internet were able to take a break and, and have something to eat as well. So really excited about this afternoon, our speakers. Uh, joining me first is Nicole Darden Ford. She's the Vice President for IT and the Global Information Security and Chief Information Security Officer for Baxter International Incorporated. Nicole has global responsibility for information security as well as information technology quality compliance and information governance supporting Baxter. Nicole joined Baxter in December of 2016 from Venable LLP, an AMLAW 100 law firm where she was director of information security. Nicole has held a variety of leadership roles within the private sector and federal government, including the Joint Chiefs of Staff. She serves in leadership roles for various Baxter employee groups including the Global Inclusion Council, African American Leadership Council, and Baxter Women Leaders. She lives this every day, what we talked about this morning. Uh, she's a great resource and it's wonderful she's taking time to come out today and, and add to our workshop. So please join me in welcoming Nicole Ford. Good afternoon. So um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the road to cyber resilience. So when we talk about cybersecurity, it's a relatively new term. Most people hear about it. Um, I believe that in some instances as a citizen, you've been impacted in some way through identity theft, um, stolen or lost credit cards, maybe a, a phishing attempt via email. Um, that is the life in the times of organizations such as Baxter. Um, we are a healthcare organization um, focused on saving and sustaining lives. And so as a result, there are a lot of bad guys out there that would like to steal the information that we have or impact our devices so that they can impact our patients, which ultimately are people like you. Cyber resilience is important and it's a new term. And so we're gonna go over cyber resilience. What does it mean for Baxter? What does it mean um, in other organizations around the globe? And what are we fighting? Who are we fighting? And then what are the best ways in which we can continue to protect the organizations that we serve? A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Nicole Ford. Um, I, I am the Chief Information Security Officer for Baxter. I have global responsibility, so you know, Baxter's in 85 countries around the globe, so it's my responsibility to make sure that we defend and protect the organization as well as the products and our customers. Um, prior to that, I worked for a law firm. Um, really, really exciting times because there's new cybersecurity legislation that's happening pretty much continuously right now, so got an opportunity to be a part of that ecosystem. Um, I've served at, in healthcare for about 10 years. Um, I really, I love the healthcare mission. I believe that um, healthcare is something that should be affordable and everybody should have access to, so that's an area that I really, really feel passionate about. Prior to that, I served in the federal government, working in uh, the US Department of State and Department of Agriculture, and then prior to that, I served in the, in the military, in the US Army and work for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So I have a really varied um, amount of experience. Cyber wasn't something that I woke up one day and said, hey, I wanna be a Chief Information Security Officer. It didn't exist back then. There was not a name for it. We just did it. And we called it IT. And that was it. So everything kind of fell under information technology. And so did security. So um, I learned pretty much organically um, through my experience in the military, um, and I continue to learn. Um, I have several cybersecurity certifications. Um, I've taught as an adjunct professor, and um, again, I really, um, really am an advocate for African Americans as well as women um, joining the field of technology. Um, so I do um, advocate that, and then. I love the work that I do. I think it's extremely important. And so coming in to talk to you guys about cybersecurity 
and you know the field and helping you understand like what are the challenges in the space. And then I know some people are gonna ask, hey, how do I get into cybersecurity? There are so many ways that you can really get into the field and, and make this a promising career for yourself. The internet in 60 seconds. So when you think about defending and protecting an organization, the internet has made that increasingly difficult, right? So you have to think about it. In 60 seconds, there are 5,500 check-ins for Foursquare. Most people are like, what's Foursquare? Um, every time you go somewhere, you check in. Um, email sent, 165 million emails go out every 60 seconds. Um, 65,000 photos are uploaded, 3.8 million searches on Google. How impactful is that? So imagine being in my spot, right? Where you're in an organization, you have 55,000 people, and everybody is doing something. Everybody's hitting the internet. Everybody's going to social media. Everybody is you know, doing their jobs, which includes just outreach to other people outside of the organization. And then protecting to make sure that anything that comes in is not malicious, and things, and only what we want to come in, and things that go out, we wanna make sure it's safe as well. The Internet of Things. So IoT devices is huge for us, right? So we're a medical device company. We create medical devices. And so they have to be connected to the Internet. So this goes back to sensors, you know, your phone, your, you know, your wearables. So if you have a, a watch or something that's connected, that has a sensor and it's connected to the internet. So now, instead of just protecting the 55,000 people, I have to protect their devices, workstations, laptops, you know, all the other devices that are connected to include the medical devices that we provide to our customers. They have to be protected as well. So exponentially, everything has increased. So more than 21 billion devices by 2020 will be connected. That makes the CISO's job extremely complicated. Not just the protection of the perimeter, which you know, I know you guys, this is the Homeland Security Institute, so you really focused on protecting the perimeter, but also protecting the people, the devices, and all of the most important things that we pr provide to our customers that save and sustain lives. So you have to have a strategy and a plan to be able to protect the, the organization and everything associated with that organization. And so that's what I'm gonna talk to you about in a little bit. The rise of threats in the market. How many of you guys heard about WannaCry on the news or somewhere else? Raise, a, raise your hand. Okay, so a few of you guys know what WannaCry is. WannaCry happened last year, and it was one of the biggest like ransomware attacks across the globe. In some instances, some of our competitors were shut down for months. Not only did it do damage to their environment, but it impacted their balance sheet, meaning that they couldn't get products out to market, um, which caused shortages in some instances. So imagine if you were looking, if you needed some needed medical device, right? And we couldn't provide that to you because of a cyber attack. That's what happened last year. And when it starts to be so impactful that it now impacts your balance sheet, meaning that when you go to market, you gotta tell the market, hey, we had this big cyber attack and it cost us millions and millions of dollars to recover. That's like unprecedented. Let me give you another scenario. So last year, the FDA for the first time um, recalled pacemakers. So imagine there's a recall for a pacemaker, something that is internal to somebody's body. Basically it said, hey, you have to patch that pacemaker because it will impact the person, meaning that it will either slow down or go too fast, which could potentially cause death. That was the first time ever that FDA has ever recalled a medical device for a, cyber, for a cyber vulnerability. So there's been so many unprecedented or new, new things happening. It's really, really 
become, cybersecurity has become like the new hotness, right? So, you know, there was a point in time where people didn't know what I did. They were like, oh, you're in security. Yeah, so are the guards, are they in place? I don't know, I don't do that, right? I don't know, guns, guards, that's not me. So now, everywhere I go, people know who I am. They know what I do, and they understand the importance of the work that a chief information security officer does. So it's changed in 10 years, like literally, my dad would ask me every time he went to, t he, he called me up, he said, hey, I was trying to tell my friend what you did, and I didn't know. I said, you work with computers. He asked if you could come over and fix his computer. <laughs> and I said, Dad, of course I can come over and fix his computer, but that's not what I do. Today, he knows exactly what I do. And he's quite proud of the work um, that I've done. Um, and to t let you know, it's in my family. My brother's in cybersecurity. Um, and my other brother's in cybersecurity. The only oddball is my sister, who happens to just be in technology. Go figure, right? Um, so we see a lot of attacks going on. Again, I'm gonna go back to global ransomware hits Merck. Merck is one of our, is a peer company. Uh, we work in the same industry. And they were hit, they were impacted so much, like I said, that they were shut down. There was one instance I wanna touch on though. Erie County Medical System, they encountered a massive cyber attack, and it basically was a ransomware attack, meaning that somebody wanted a ransom before they would unlock their systems. So their systems were unusable. And so what happened was the, the, the attacker reached out like they do and provided a ransomware note. If you've never seen one, I don't think I have a copy of one, but it's, it just basically says, we have your data, you know, and for this much, we will give it back to you. So Erie said, nope, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna pay you. We're not gonna you know, kowtow to the fact that you have our data, and we're not, we're not doing this, because once you start to pay a ransom, you always pay a ransom. So it was their policy, we don't pay ransoms. So they were down for about six weeks. They were using paper-based processes instead, right? So yeah, it didn't have a huge impact on patient safety, but it kind of did, right? So, so our systems are there to monitor and make sure um, to keep the livelihood and under monitor the livelihood of our patients. And when that's not available, that is impactful. So they hired a firm to come in and break the encryption code. And in six weeks, they were able to recover their systems. So that set a precedent, like we don't pay ransoms. What is cyber resilience? I think about cyber resilience, and it basically means that for us, it, we know that an attack is gonna occur. It's not if, it's when. And then it's how we react to that attack, right? Are we able to recover quickly? How quickly are we able to recover? Making sure that our systems are resilient enough to withstand an attack so that we can resume services very quickly. That's what cyber resilience is to us. MITRE, a couple of years ago, termed this phrase cyber resilience. It was just resilience, right? But then with all of what was going on with cyber, we coined, the, MITRE coined the phrase cyber resilience. And that was, again, there was a point in time when, when we were thinking about cyber a little differently, and that was early in my career. And we were saying, we need to prevent cyber attacks. Well, that's hard to do. That's hard to do when you're talking about millions and millions of assets, and what you can't control are people. Our biggest threat is people, and it's how people um, work with information systems, what they do, and, and their, their hygiene, and you can't control that. So prevention really doesn't work. And so now we're like, okay, great. So it's really about detection for us, detecting a threat quickly containing it, and then remediating it very quickly. That's what we're focused on today. What, what I do know is that anytime somebody gets an email, they have a propensity to click. Like it's psychologically, it's been proven that 
you're gonna get 20% of people that you could never train not to click. They're gonna click on that phishing email no matter what. So how do we protect against that 20%, right? We know that it's gonna happen. Every day we see phishing emails over and over and over. And we train our people, don't click the link. If you don't know who the email is coming from, try not to click the link. 20% of the people will do it. So how do we protect and make sure our systems are always protected against that? Cyber resilience focuses on prevention, detection, reaction in an information technology environment. So we run drills. I call it like war gaming, right? So we war game and we go through cyber threats and we figure out who needs to do what. And why do we do that? Because we need to exercise that muscle, right? We need, every time a phishing attack occurs, there should be a consistent process that our teams follow, right? And if we continue to do that and build that muscle, then we know at some point we're really good at how we handle those type of attacks. But imagine the threat actors are really sophisticated and they're getting even more sophisticated every day. We have different type, and there are different types of threat actors out there with different motivations. So it depends, a nation state, what's interesting about nation states to me, and, and you know, some, some people will probably refute me on this, but nation states work during office hours, typically, right? Just they're around the globe. So, you know, Russia, their nation state, they have like people that are focused on cyber and attacks. And that's all they do. They come to work with their lunch pail every day. They go in at eight o'clock, they leave at five. And they attack during their time frames. It happens all around the globe. China, same thing. We know, we can see these patterns. We can tell you, oh yeah, China's on. They're up. They have a, diff they have a set of attack patterns that are pretty consistent. And you know, okay, that's Russia. Yeah, they're, Russia's a little noisy. So we know, yeah, so that's Russia. And that really kind of, it, it's, it's pretty standard. Then there are really sophisticated attackers that are really focused in, on money. They're focused, this is a job for them, just like the mafia. Like we, we go every day, and we figure out how we can set up an attack so that we can make money. So we'll send an email, or they'll send an email to an organization a phishing email that says, hey, Bob, don't forget to pay that bill. Here's the link for the bill. It's about $130,000. What does Bob do? If he's in that 20% we talked about, what does he do? He clicks the link. He clicks the link. Sometimes Bob will pay the bill, <laughs> right? Sometimes they'll call us and say, oops, I clicked the link and some payload will land on his machine and then we have to deal with that. So there's, again, the, the, the threat landscape has changed and so running these drills really help us to figure out how to, how, what strategies we have to use for specific attacks. And they change, I'm talking monthly, monthly. People are extremely sophisticated. And so imagine a whole world of people and you've got a subset of cyber, of cyber people out there. Cyber good people, cyber bad people, right? And all they're doing is thinking about how they can bypass security controls. How successful can they be? Cyber resilience helps us to stay in business. It helps us to continue to do the work that helps drive revenue, helps to bring needed services to citizens. And so having a cyber resilience framework is extremely important. So there are seven steps towards cyber resilience, and I thought I would touch on some of them. Um, the first one is basic cyber hygiene. So you think about hygiene, right? We talk about brushing your teeth, combing your hair, washing your face. It's the same thing in cyber. There are certain things we have to do. If we don't do, the, do them well, it doesn't work. So, and that is patching systems. See, at your house, you have a computer system, right? And it's optional for you to patch. 
You can say, oh, you know, Microsoft will send you an update, and you can say yes or no. You make the decision to do that. At work, that's a requirement. Patching everything, every, every time we have an opportunity is a requirement for us because that's the way the attacker gets in. He goes through a known vulnerability. He finds that known vulnerability. Some of those vulnerabilities are 20 years old. I'll give an example. Spectra meltdown was a vulnerability in our chips. But guess what? Everybody had the chip, right? So what do we do? What do we do? Do we patch? What decision would an organization make versus a personal, personal consumer? We find a way to patch. It's absolutely necessary. We call the chip vendor. We figure out what's going on and how we can mitigate that vulnerability. Why? Because all it takes is one attacker to use that vulnerability. Now that it's public, everybody knows about it, right? So now an attacker knows too. So he knows to go get, the, you know, really, he learns how to circumvent the system there, and he can use that vulnerability to get into our systems. So we always have to be one step ahead of the attacker. We need to understand his motivation. We need to understand what attackers are focused on our industry, because there are very specific attackers for different industries. They're not all the same. And that intelligence we get from the FBI and other intelligence sources um, really help us to make good choices. But hygiene is most important. And there are other things like security configurations, making sure that all of our systems have configurations that are consistent, that have the right security controls in place, that we can test against that to make sure that those controls are always working. That's what's most important. On the consumer side, you guys don't do that. You go to Best Buy, you buy a computer, you fire it up, you may put antivirus on it, you check your email, you do basic stuff, Maybe you go to social media, you may send a, um, a picture to your grandparents or your, or your brother, your uncle, that's what you use it for. But in corporate America, where we're using our computers and now everything is digital, everything is IT centric, we're using it to make money, it becomes increasingly important that we do, we do things like have consistent configurations. And there's so many other things that we look for too. As CISOs, our job is to make sure that we have a baseline and we understand what's going on in our environment at all times. I'll give an example. I get a call last night, one o'clock in the morning. Do I pick up? Did I pick up? Yes, no? Absolutely. It's my job, right? I get a call saying, hey, there's a problem. This is what's going on. What, what do you want us to do? And it was, I need more information. So one o'clock turns into two o'clock, two o'clock turns into three. Now we've been on the phone because it's all about gathering intelligence for me so that we can make the right decision so that I don't have to call the CIO or you know, the upper executive management team to say, hey, something's going on. I really don't know what it is. I can't do that, right? And so it's about gathering the information and making a risk-based decision for our organization that's gonna keep us running, right? That happens every day. We're on the front line in a different way. We're not, you know, the first responder, thank you. We're not res first responders, but the battlefield has changed, right? The battlefield is cyber. The next war may be a cyber war. It's gonna be people like me that are focused on defending organizations, territories, or perimeters as we call it, and really making sure that we have the right tools, techniques, and tactics to keep our company safe, and ultimately America. <coughs> Embrace the cloud for security. So in our world, you know, traditionally everything was on-prem in a data center. So we have these big data centers, you know, and most of the time you don't know where they are, right? Because they're in secret locations. We don't let folks know. But those data centers have really, really important information, servers that house information, right? That allow us to do our jobs. But cloud 
has changed the game for us. Um, security professionals are really embracing cloud. Amazon Web Services or Azure from Microsoft. <laughs> that was a good plug. <laughs> um, and um, these cloud environments help us to set up secure environments quick. What used to take us months to do now takes us seconds. And we have consistency in our patterns so that we know, yes, it has our 34 key controls for our system. They're invoked, they're working, they're operational. The cloud allows us very rapid deployment of security controls and really helps us in a lot of ways even do our jobs faster. Now the goal is to embrace the cloud. It takes a lot to keep an infrastructure um, up to date. If you think about it, you have a, if you have a garden at home, it takes a lot to keep that garden running. I mean, a lot of care and feeding, you gotta water, you gotta hoe all the dead weeds out, you gotta do all these things. The cloud, we don't have to do all that. All we have to do is host our system on the cloud. We have secure templates, apply the template, and we know that things are working and we're able to monitor very quickly, but it allows for very rapid and fast delivery of services. Implement a data-centric approach to security. So we call data the crown jewels, right? That's kind of cool though, right? So when you hear somebody say crown jewels, that's code word for the most important information in that environment. Everything is not important. The same way that if you're in war, you have specific perimeters that you set up, and that is to protect the most important things. This is the same thing in our data-driven world. All security controls are not created equal. We provide security controls based on the criticality of that data, how important it is. Is it our IP, right? Is it patient data? Is it your data? That's important to us. So we would apply a different set of controls for that data versus just regular data that really, at the end of the day, uh, if something happens, we're not as concerned. We have tons of assets, so we can't, it's hard to defend everything the same way. We used to use, back in, the, and we always say, we used to use this moat, it was like we had a castle, castle moat um, security um, posture, and that was, we're gonna put everything in this one circle and then there is a moat and you have to go across the moat to get to the crown jewels. With people being mobile and around the world and we're such a global organization, we can't do that anymore. So imagine every person in this room, when you go, if you're global, you, that's our perimeter. We have to protect the endpoint, which is the workstation or the laptop instead of just protecting the perimeter of the organization, which is like the firewall. It's what we used to protect. So that's changed a lot. So we've, uh, we are now approaching things a little differently. It's more data-centric, meaning that we focus more on the data, how critical it is, and we apply stringent controls around the most critical data. Requires security by design and privacy by design. Security by design means that in everything that we do, somebody from security is represented there. They're there to advise and consult that team that's creating new software. I'll give an example. I know you guys heard about how you know, Facebook had some challenges. You heard about the challenges of Facebook, right? That impacted everybody. Here's the challenge. So because Facebook had that issue, I was really bummed out when they said, now we're gonna hire like thousands of new security professionals. That bummed me out. Because now there's one more um, company out there that has to compete with me for recruiting people. I was like, shoot. Um, but security by design just means that we have now ra risen the level of importance for cybersecurity, right? So in everything we do, when we deploy a new app, Security is at the table now. Anything we do has to have a security lens associated with it. Why? Because now we're impacting the balance sheets. If a cyber attack happens and it's big enough, it has to be reported to the SEC. That's like unprecedented. The SEC didn't even know what cyber was five years ago. But today they've issued guidance now 
that anytime there's a cyber attack, we have to let people know immediately. We have to let the public know. We can't wait, because a lot of times we like to wait, right? We need more data. We want to know and be sure. But now they're saying, nope, you can't do that. You need to tell us as soon as you think that there's an incident. So like Equifax, Equifax waited a little while. That was a challenge. Deloitte just had an incident last year. They waited a, at least six months before they reported. That was unacceptable to the SEC. And certainly if you were a part of that or your information was compromised, you would think it was unacceptable as well. Um, build cyber resilience and adopt proactive defense measures such as pen testing, hunting, and red teaming. You know, I have teams of people that hunt. They're trying to find things that may happen. They're really testing our systems. I call it stress testing our systems to see what potentially an attacker would do so that we can protect against that. These teams are pretty cool, right? And so what's interesting is, as I have always said, I said, you know, cyber needs a, um, to be rebranded, right? Because typically when you think about cyber, what do you think about? You think about a young, a young guy in a corner sn looking sneaky, right? <laughs> you know, over there with a computer. Well, it's changed a lot. Cyber's changed a lot. I'm hoping to get more women interested. It's really, really exciting and fun, even you know, despite what people say, it is highly technical, but it's a really, really rewarding place to be. So I have penetration testing teams and threat hunting teams. These teams are focused on helping us figure out what's wrong with our own systems. Why? Because it's nothing like having an attacker come and tell you or, or penetrate your systems. Wouldn't you rather know yourself, figure it out, and fix it? And so that's what we like to do be more proactive. Adopt DevSecOps processes and bringing together IT modernization and cybersecurity investment. Technology is changing so quickly. Think about how many iPhones have come out in such a very short period of time. You know, new technology comes out every day. We have to figure out how to defend and support that technology, how to protect that technology. So as a part of it, we just wanna make sure in organizations that we keep our systems as modern as possible, we bring in the newest technology that we can that'll solve the problem, and that one size doesn't fit all. So we have to really stay on top of what's out on the market and make sure that we get the best technology and solutions out there. And some of the ways in which we do that is we stay really close to Silicon Valley and where innovation is occurring so that um, we are on top of what's coming out, how can it help us, and how do we apply it to our organization. So the CISO has to wear a lot of hats. Promote a security first mindset. Security is everyone's responsibility. I'm sure you've heard that from other CISOs, but it's true. We can't protect what we don't know. We need everybody to be on the front line with us and understand their responsibility. That means what? Don't click the link. That means making sure that you stay on top of your updates. You don't introduce a vulnerability to us by bringing in a thumb drive with some files that are malicious or have bad a, a virus on them, right? That you do your part. And that's what's most important, is that you, if you see something, what do you do? Say something. And part of that is making sure that you guys are the eyes and ears for your organization about what's going on, what looks a little suspicious, what doesn't look normal. That's how we get most of our information is from our people. They call and say, something's not right. All of a sudden, my, my computer started rebooting itself. Ooh, that's bad. Or it looks like somebody took control of my computer. What do I do next? So those are things that if they look strange or weird, chances are today, they probably are. Here's some of the current challenges we face as, um, in the cybersecurity realm today. We have 59% of our positions are unfilled. That is impactful. We can't find people that can fill the role. And a lot of times CISOs, I mean, we're scouring the globe looking for people. It's getting lower, but for every one cybersecurity professional, there are about four or five jobs. So can you imagine, how do you really compete 
with the Googles and the Facebooks and the Microsofts and all of the companies out there that are huge and, and looking for the same talent you're looking for. That's the challenge that we have. So we have to make it really exciting for our, our workforce. We have to make it impactful for them. We give them, you know, we have to think outside the box because that's extremely important. 39% of respondents say the inability to understand business needs. Here's the challenge. A lot of times it's hard for people to transition from being a business person to being a technical person, much less a cyber person. And we, we battle with that. But a lot of times, and just to let you guys know, CISOs are creating programs to make that easier and easier, right? We, we would love to bring in people who don't have a technical background and train them on tech, you know, technical expertise as well as teach them cyber. That's what we have to do. A lot of times we're training people from the ground up to bring in the best and the brightest talent. It takes all of these things together to make for a really, really good program. Security operations is a really, really important, what I call our bread and butter, right? Security operations are the people who are eyes on glass, watching for security events all the time. They're working around the clock, and I have people around the globe doing that, around the globe, 24 by seven, eyes on glass. We see a range of about 10 billion to 30 billion events a month. That range could be whittled down to about 2%, right? The 2% is what we respond to. And that's what my team is mo most focused on. Workforce readiness is important. Our capability maturity, how mature is our organization? How mature is our cyber program? Do we have the right people? Do we have the right processes? This is what I spend most of my time, making sure that I have I have a, real, a total view of my security posture, and I'm able to report to senior management that we're gonna be okay. We have an enterprise risk management strategy that kind of ties everything together. And that is, what are the risks that we're willing to take as an organization? What risks are we willing to transfer? A part of it is everybody knows we should have a good cyber insurance policy. They now have cyber insurance. Just like you have auto insurance, we have cyber insurance. And we have it because it's not if, it's when. And then we have to focus on the magnitude of the issue and whether or not we have the funds to support whatever happens. Cyber incidents are, cost billions, billions. When it comes down to it, Target paid a lot of money. It was a lot of money for their, for their breach. Sony, same thing. Another thing that we know is that 60% of all of our attacks were, were carried out by insiders. That means people in the organization. Not only do I have to know what's going on external, I also need to know what's going on inside. I need to know what people are doing. I need to understand what they're downloading, what they're printing. That's important. Why? Because they could take the IP out the door with them as they go to another company to work. So I'm not only protecting the external part, but the internal part of the organization. So these are some really important areas. These are things that I focus on every day. Um, we need to always assess our maturity as an organization. We have to use risk management to determine what risk we should focus on. Um, roadmap development, I have a, a three-year roadmap that basically says we're gonna do this you know, during this time, and these are the new technologies we're gonna deploy. I have to go to the board and I have to present that to them at least annually. And then compliance. There are a lot of, we're in a really heavily regulatory environment, so we have HIPAA, we have all sorts of, of regulations coming at us. China has a new cybersecurity law, as well as uh, GDPR, which is in Europe. All of these things kind of converge, and we have to be able to meet all of the regulations around the world. That, that offers another level of complexity to the job. So one of these are the things that the CISOs are all worried about, no matter where you are. Create credibility, catch the culture. It's our job to be the cyber champion, so we always have to focus on the culture of the organization. We have to focus on risk. We have to have a detailed strategy. We have to deliver, and we have to invest in people. That's my, that's my roadmap, that's what I do every day. So I have this one little, um, um, I guess, uh, pictorial. The CEO, look at his position when he sleeps. 
The CFO is always worried about money, so he sleeps on his side. The COO, he just has a lot of operational tasks to focus on, so he sleeps on his back. But the CISO never sleeps. We don't even get in the bed. So I close with, um, I love the work that I do. I think cyber is the next, is the new, I call it the new hotness, because it is a role that you will never be without a job. Um, and there's, if you're a problem solver, this is the, this is the field for you. Thank you. If we have anyone that has a question for Nicole, I can start because I have one that came in on the internet. This comes from someone in Michigan. They said, um, how do you excite young people? You talked about careers in cybersecurity. How do you excite young people for a career in that field? Um, a couple of ways. Um, we host events like hackathons. Um, we show them how, you know, we actually bring them to Baxter to really learn what we do. We take them to our security operations center. We want to debunk the myths first, right? So what does it mean? Does it mean that I'm going to be sitting behind a keyboard all day? No, that's not what cyber is about. You know, a lot of times cyber is about investigation, problem solving, and using your analytical skills. So we debunk those myths and we host events so that people can see what cyber really is like. Um, you know, I also um, do workshops for young women, um, STEM workshops, because I want to get them excited about the work that we do. And, and I show them what cyber really looks like, not what they heard, not what they see, but what it really looks like. And I think that really excites people. I can certainly tell you this, people who work on my team, enjoy the work that they do, and people who don't want to come work for me. Because it's my job to make it exciting. It's my job to you know, bring challenges to the table and, and empower the younger people on my team to take those challenges and really figure them out. So it really is, you got to have a passion for the mission. Um, I love healthcare. I love our mission. That's important to me, but make sure you got to be in a, in a place where you enjoy working and cyber is exciting too. And you see that together, it makes it a really great opportunity. And Nicole, just to add on to that, are there any particular skills that someone needs to possess to, to be successful in, in this career? I think so. I've, I'm an educator, so it's challenging for me because I've, I teach people the skills. And what I see is it's not just the technical skills that you need. Of course, you, know, you, know, you need to have basic 101, understand what a computer is, really kind of get a, the basics and the foundation. But I also see that if you have good communication skills, good writing skills, good problem solving skills, you can be really successful. So cyber, there are different, there are different like um, positions for different people. There are people that are truly technical and they typically will do pen testing, they'll do coding, they'll sit on your threat intelligence side, but then there are forward facing people. I have people on my team that are less technical, they understand the technical work, but they're more forward facing, they work with our customers and our clients and stuff like that because they enjoy that work. So I think that there's, there are positions for everybody. It's just a matter of, really taking a deeper dive and figuring out where you fit in that ecosystem. Well, thank you and thank you for your service as well. So my question is, so my company touches IoT just like your company does and you know the whole WannaCry, um, while not directly, well, maybe not directly impacting Baxter, but how, do you, how does a company like Baxter protect against a device you sell and someone uses it past the, the, the lifespan of that device and you put end of life notices out there and they still use it and all of a sudden, you know, 15 years later, they get hit, or 10 years later, they get hit by a, a virus and it's got your name on that device. So, you know, that's, how does it, you know, I'm sure you've had those type of discussions and not sharing any, anything confidentially, but holistically, how do, how do you protect against that? So you, it's a risk-based decision. So I own product security. So that's fielded devices out in the field. Legacy is a challenge for us. It's a challenge for everybody in the field um, and in, this, um, in the IoT space, right? Like the useful life is seven years, but you know, a hospital keeps some, uh, some device for 10 or 15 years. 
Um, in some instances, we continue to support those devices because we believe in our mission. Um, that has become challenging, and FDA, I believe, is going to come out with some more guidance on how to handle that for uh, medical devices. Um, I don't know that we have a magic bullet. I think it, at times it's case for case basis, and it, it's based on that risk profile for that device for us. So, I mean, without telling you a whole lot, we, we do, we, that is an area of, of risk for all companies. Um, and we are always weighing and balancing what, we, what we're gonna continue to support based on what we're not gonna be continue to support. But traditionally, Baxter has supported those legacy devices over the, uh, over the life cycle and then some. So that's the stance we've you know, continued to take, is really making sure that our customers are taken care of. Hi, uh, thank you for your service, by the way, as a Joint Chief of Staff. Um, you mentioned some interesting legislation at the very beginning, and you mentioned um, GDP and uh, what China has. Um, can you say anything on any other legislation that you might have seen that you thought was exciting or interesting for your company or business? Well, so GDPR just came out last year, year before, really 2016-ish. Yep. Um, and we're, you know, getting ready to go into the um, implement. We're in the implementation phase, and they're they're coming to the end of, hey, now you have to have it in place in mm -hmm. May, right? Everybody's following suit. So GDPR is a privacy regulation, really, yep. where it allows, you know, uh, EU residents to the right to be forgotten, meaning that they can call up Google or Microsoft or anybody and say, um, we want you to delete our information. And they have to. That's, that's what the legislation states. So the, I would certainly say that the EU was forward facing, meaning that they were the first, but everybody's following suit behind them. So I've heard of the legislation coming out in Latin America, it's getting ready to come out. China, um, Canada is coming out, I think um, next year, they're coming out with the same legislation. And um, I heard that it was gonna come out, like, there's another country in Asia that it's gonna, the same type of um, legislation is gonna come out. So we're seeing that you're gonna see a lot of privacy related legislation where citizens want their data to be safe and secure mm -hmm. or they don't want you to have it. Yeah. So you'll, you'll continue to see that change. Um, as far as like cybersecurity, we're seeing cybersecurity legislation changing you know, throughout the landscape and so everybody's starting to pick it up. Mm -hmm. So we're just gonna see every country having their own cybersecurity legislation. Yeah. Maybe a little different. I know that um, Russia yeah. has new cybersecurity legislation mm -hmm. as well, so we, ha we have to meet that. Yeah. And there, those are just the demands that are coming. Like, as people get more mature in an understanding of what happens and that their data is not as protected as they thought it was, you're gonna continue to see legislation come out to protect mm -hmm. people, consumers, and customers. Thank you, Nicole.